Good evening. And for some of you from around the world, uh, good morning. Over the next eight weeks, Professor David Hooker will take us through a journey, a journey of the mind, but hopefully also of the heart. Together, we will imagine new stories of race and religion. I'm Mahan Mirza, Executive Director of the Ansari Institute for Global Engagement with Religion at the University of Notre Dame. And the Institute is within the Keough School of Global Affairs. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you and to introduce our professor. First, a word about Ansari. Established in 2017 and inaugurated in 2018, the Rafat and Zorin Ansari Institute for Global Engagement with Religion is dedicated to studying, learning from, and collaborating with religious communities worldwide for advancing human dignity and the common good. These classes for everyone are designed mainly for us to connect with the South Bend community and, and to connect the community with the university campus. We do our best to engage topics of contemporary relevance and interest. Since we're meeting online because of the pandemic, we're able to welcome participants from other parts of the country and even other parts of the world. If you are not on our mailing list, uh, you can sign up at ansari.nd.edu. And if you happen to be on social media, you can also follow us on Twitter at Ansari UND. We are privileged to have with us Professor David Hooker for the next eight weeks. His areas of expertise are post-conflict community building, environmental justice, public policy and social justice, multi-party conflicts, negotiation and mediation. In addition to being a core faculty member of the Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies at the Keough School uh, here at Notre Dame, Professor Hooker has worked with communities, governments, international NGOs, and civil society organizations. He has managed multi-party conflicts, conducted workshops, and consulted across the US and around the world. He is also a lawyer who has represented the state of Georgia as assistant attorney general, and he is the president and principal consultant of Counter Stories, Counter Stories Consulting LLC, where his work focuses on narrative alignment for civic community and faith leaders. Professor Hooker's uh, academic credentials include a Master's of Divinity and JD from Emory University as well as a PhD from the Netherlands. So I can't think of a better person in the world to take us through this journey of imagining new stories of race and religion. We're so honored to have you. David, uh, take it away. So thank you, Mahan. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, participate in the process, the learning for all uh, process. And so I'm, I'm looking forward to these conversations. I should do a couple of things. It's always, it's, sometimes it's bad protocol to start with the limitations, but let me, let me start with a few limitations so that you all have a sense of where, we, where we're going. It may be slightly uh, misleading to consider me the instructor for the course. My intention is to be a facilitator for an ongoing set of conversations. I'm going to probably next week begin introducing some theoretical kind of frameworks that we can use to have the same language, but very rarely are we going to spend time in instruction. Um, what I'm hoping to do each week is to tee up a subject and then to invite you know, a few of you, four or five of the participants who are willing to use the little participant button and raise your hand uh, to come in as panelists and then allow us to talk. And so that would be what I anticipate to be the rhythm of our time together is me talking for 10, no more than 15 minutes at the beginning to tee up our subject and then inviting 
and trying to construct kind of a diverse conversation panel that we might wrestle together with some ideas. Uh, what you will notice is that I am neither a scholar of religion or the sociology of race. My work is in conflict transformation, post-conflict peace building and justice seeking work. And so it often happens that the context in which I work are deeply informed and influenced by the cultural narratives of religion and race. So working in Myanmar, working in Somalia, in South Sudan, uh, in Nigeria, in um, the Mississippi Delta, in Greensboro, North Carolina, in, uh, in the Bay Area, the Cali Bay Area, uh, at the intersection of multiple uh, ethnically segregated uh, street organizations. Uh, you, you come to learn about the intersection of religion and race. And my primary focus is on narratives, like the, the narratives being, and we'll talk more about this really next week, but narratives, how the constructs are, are the, the broad constructs that inform the way that we tell stories, the way that we live our lives. We live our lives in story form. And so we will want to play with that, but we want to play with it um, in particular as it relates to notions of religion and race. What that means is, or what that, what often happens, and I will, I'll say this, this is for us up front. What often happens is people experience their experience of religion and race as though it's true. And they regard everyone else's experience of religion and race, if it's different, as either problematic, foreign, or even wrong. And what we're going to invite is a spirit, a spirit of uh, curiosity, a spirit of wonder, as we seek to engage this, as we try to peel back and notice places where we may not have examined before, where, what are the narratives that are informing the way that we make meaning in certain contexts? What are the narratives, particularly those narratives that are formed and shaped uh, and contained in religious uh, doctrine, religious writings, and the narratives that have been societally constructed around the fiction of race? Um, how do those get uh, interpreted? How do they get played out? How do they inform the way that we show up in the world? So um, today, right now, I'm actually sitting in Georgia. I'm in what would be, what is, not would be, but is the unseated and still occupied territory of the Shawnee, of the East Band of the Cherokee, of the Muscogee Creek, of the Yuchi people, the indigenous people of this Turtle Island. Um, but I'm here primarily because I've been here working and working in relationship to the recent two Senate elections, the election and the runoff between uh, the Reverend Dr. Raphael Warnock, um, the senior pastor of Ebenezer Baptist Church and uh, Mrs. Kelly Loeffler, and then the other race between uh, Mr. David Perdue and Mr. John Ossoff. And for our first conversation, what I really wanted just to tee up and have us begin to play with are taking a look at how religion and race informed those two races and then Subsequently, because they were the ele those elections happened on January 5th, the runoffs happened on January 5th. And before we could make good meaning of that, religion and race showed up again in the interactions that took place on the mall and at the Capitol 
uh, in Washington, D.C. on January 6th in relationship to the attempt to certify the election, the presidential election, which, had, as most of you are certainly aware, had been uh, extremely contested, highly contentious, bitterly fought election. And religion and race reared their had implications again uh, in the narratives that were being crafted and the actions that were taken on January 6th. And so I wanted to just begin to have some, to invite some curiosity and some conversation around how you see those play out. What, what I'd like to do first, just to tee this conversation up is to share a few uh, insights or a few observations that took place uh, in various newspapers um, in relationship to both the January 6th events and the, uh, the election, the Georgia elections with Raphael Warnock and Loeffler and uh, David Perdue and John Ossoff. Let me just make an observation. The Ossoff Purdue runoff certainly had religious uh, implications. There, there were uh, religious overtones, uh, there were claims uh, of anti Semitism that were leveled against the Purdue campaign for things like. Uh, making commercials that seem to exaggerate the size of the nose and the shape of the forehead of uh, John Ossoff, kind of following the subliminal anti-Semitic trope uh, and, and using that kind of as a calling. And there were also attempts to connect Ossoff Mr. Ossoff with, um, with anti-Semitic, you know, these long-term anti-Semitic uh, tropes of not being faithful to the United States, having dual loyalties, um, then the connection to kind of the alleged Jewish uh, domination of banking and media and the way that Mr. Ossoff was connected in some ways to George Soros, who was always a kind of a Jewish boogeyman uh, for the far right. Um, and so there were religious implications in the way that that race was run. But there were clearly and actually much more firmly drawn lines in the race between uh, Reverend Warnock and Kelly Loeffler. Uh, Rafi Warnock, who is, like Martin Luther King, a junior, a graduate of Morehouse College, my alma mater. Um, he also happens to be the senior pastor at Ebenezer Baptist Church. And he didn't run as much as a politician as he did as a uh, socially justice-oriented pastor. And when he did that, it turns out that a lot of the arguments against him seem to be questioning his faith in particular ways that both challenged religious interpretations, but also brought in racial narratives. So a couple of observations. In, in the New York Times, let's see, in the New York Times, there was an article describing a rally that took place in Dalton, Georgia. Dalton is a town in North Georgia, small, it's not really rural anymore. It is kind of expanding beyond being rural, but it is still, uh, the Dalton metro area is very much surrounded with kind of a rural uh, flavor. It's a predominantly white North Georgia town. Um, and there was a set of 
rallies that were happening in favor of Purdue and Kelly Loeffler. The rallies were described as the Christian citizen barnstorming tour. And one of the key speakers at the Christian citizens barnstorming tour was Michelle Bachman, uh, who was at one time a congressman from Minnesota, at one time a presidential candidate, a uh, still a very popular speaker among evangelical and uh, right-leaning groups, particularly when there's church involved. Um, and Ms. Bachman says, I'm quoting here from uh, an article written to describe the event. Ms. Bachman says, we have got to have these two Senate seats in Georgia. That's why the church is so important because in the church, you get the truth. You get the importance of the word of God. She goes on to say, in this Baptist church tonight, we're gonna cry out to the holy God of the universe who can deliver and we're going to ask that God for those two Senate seats and we're gonna ask him for a second term for Donald Trump. Please note that that request was well after all 50 states had certified their statewide elections, but there was still a cry for a particular uh, miraculous intervention by God on behalf of Donald Trump. Uh, and one of, the, one of the people who spoke afterwards or just was interviewed afterwards was a woman named Sue Rubin, who's from a town not far from Dalton, about 40 miles from Dalton, uh, town of Canton. And she said, I'm not voting based on political parties. I'm voting based on biblical values. And she went on to describe the liberation theology of Reverend Warnock as being against God and against the Bible. So it's just an observation. Some people were mixing, deeply mixing their um, political uh, interpretations with their faith commitments. Similarly, uh, Reverend Warnock was doing the exact same thing. But what we know, what we recognize is that there are groups of people who use the same foundational text or material, the biblical scriptures, and arrive at two very different, distinctly different sets of interests and concerns. Um, there are those that are described as evangelical. Uh, my pastor, uh, Dwight Andrews, uh, was quoted in the Christian Science Monitor saying, whenever you hear evangelical, it means quite evangelical. But evangelicals who tend to look at and focus on uh, individual salvation, as opposed to one strand, not certainly not exclusively, but one strand of kind of black church tradition that focuses on a social gospel. But it's not, but this is where the, the critique of the faith, the critique of Raphael Warnock's faith positions mixed with narratives around race because it wasn't a unconscious decision to describe his positions as unpatriotic. He was also described as dangerous, and untrustworthy, which are clearly narratives that have been used to characterize, um, you know, black, particularly black men, over time. So um, there, there are these ways, and we could delve more deeply into it. But I want to begin to think about together about how your understanding and experience of race and religion have overlapped. How is it that, at least as it relates to, so let me, let me back up and say one thing. When I say religion, I don't always mean Christianity. I'm not, religion isn't 
isn't just Christian. Let's be clear. We're going to, during the eight weeks, we're going to look at how race and narratives of race play out in other traditions as well. Uh, and try and invite a couple of other guest conversational partners into that conversation. But in this moment, as I'm talking about the Bible Belt in the Southern United States, it's clear you would expect that race would play a significant role. You would expect that religion would play a significant role. And it just so happened that this contest between Warnock and Loeffler laid these things bare. And it points to that thing that Dr. King says, he was known as saying, which was that 11 o'clock on Sunday morning in the United States was the most segregated hour in America, at least as it, at the time that he was speaking where we were primarily looking at black and white and uh, Christianity as the dominant religious narrative, 11 o'clock uh, is the most segregated hour in America. So, um, so you've got what was happening in Georgia surrounding these two Senate races, uh, the social gospel of Raphael Warnock, the liberation theologian, uh, PhD professor, or not professor, but PhD uh, and you know, ordained Black Baptist pastor and a woman who was comfortable challenging his faith positions as a part of her political, as part of her political stance. And you've got the kind of uh, both blatant and undercurrent of anti-Semitism in the Purdue Ossoff race. That was what was happening in Georgia. On January 6th, this is another, another article actually from the New York Times. On January 6th, there was this observation in Washington, Dateline, Washington. Before self-proclaimed members of the far-right group, the Proud Boys, marched towards the US Capitol on Wednesday, they stopped to kneel in the street and prayed in the name of Jesus. The group whose participants have espoused misogynistic and anti-immigrant views prayed for God to bring reformation and revival. Recognizing that the Proud Boys are an avowedly white nationalist organization they gave thanks for the wonderful nation we've all been blessed to be in. And they asked God for the restoration of their quote unquote value system and for the courage and strength to both represent you, God, and represent our culture well. And they invoked divine protection for what was to come. Shortly thereafter, they went to storm the Capitol. This is the thing, not all uh, evangelical leaders supported the riotous behavior while many of them had given, uh, had given energy and sanction to a lot of the narrative and the language, they clearly separated themselves from and criticize the riotous behavior. Um, Robert Jeffries, who's a really big uh, evangelical mega church Baptist pastor in Dallas, um, you know, he he said that the siege on the Capitol has absolutely nothing to do with Christianity. Um, but this was very late in the game. And so what you see is kind of an expression of Christianity that had become intertwined with nationalism in a way that it, it, has, it takes on its own meaning, Christian nationalism. Um, and so, and that Christian nationalism has a clearly uh, 
a clear thread of white supremacist um, kind of intentions and underpinning. Religion and race inform the informed the way that the Senate races ran, religion and race shaped the, or in many ways informed or provided some of the subtext and the narrative for the siege on the Capitol that took place on January 6th. What I'm actually really interested in is inviting a few of you, if there are among you those who are uh, not Christian, I would also very much invite some, I want some internal and some external conversation partners, but I wonder if there are three or four of you, four or five of you who might be willing to join in to a panel and then let me offer a few questions and let's kind of chop it up for some conversation. So if you're willing to join, this is the first time nobody knew they were gonna join, you thought you were coming to class, but we're really not coming to be taught, we're coming to engage. And so as a conversation, if you're willing to join, if you look at the bottom and at the participants, uh, it, if you just use that and raise your hand and then uh, they will in, they will find the first four or five of you and bring you in and then we'll uh, chop it up. We'll have some chat. I can't tell if it's just going to be three of us. That's a good start. Four of us. So welcome. Um, thank you all very much for your courage in joining in this conversation, having no real idea about what's about to happen. Uh, so what I'd love for you to do is just really quickly for the rest of us, introduce yourselves, say just in a sentence or no more than two, what fascinated you about the possibility of this class and this conversation, and then I'll invite you, and then we'll we'll play. So I'm going to start with, uh, is it Ronnie? Yes, it is. Okay. Okay. Hi, obviously, my name is Ronnie. Uh, I think there has uh, been a selling out of many evangelicals. Before you go into that conversation, before you go into that conversation, just tell us like where you're calling from oh, and what introduced okay. you overall in the class. Not oh, okay. we're going to lean into that conversation, but okay. yeah. I live in Winthrop Harbor, Illinois. It's in the very northeast corner of the state. Uh, I'm a certified registered nurse anesthetist. I put people to sleep when they have surgery. Great. Perfect. Welcome. Thank Welcome. you. Uh, let's see, Stephen. Hi, uh, my name is Steven Slaybaugh. Um, I didn't actually raise my hand. I was just chosen all of a sudden, but I guess I'm happy to uh, <laughs> be a panelist, Great. I suppose. Um, I am uh, here in South Bend, Indiana. I uh, work as the uh, Director of Religious Education and Community Outreach at the Cathedral of St. James downtown. Nice. And um, nice. and uh, I'm, I'm excited to be here because uh, conversations on race and religion uh, happen at our church every day and in our community mm -hmm. and 
I want new tools and uh, opportunities to think about this. So, great, great. Uh, I'll go with Paula. I'm trying to get this uh, thing to shut up so I can talk and listen. Are you not joining us in the conversation? All right, so Paula left, so we've got Charlie. It's great to be with you all. Um, I am here in South Bend, Indiana. Um, spent the previous academic year in an inspired leadership initiative program on campus and have worked for almost 30 years with a Christian nonprofit organization and am fascinated by these topics. Perfect. And Paula, are you back? Yes, I am. That was a reminder uh, to um, uh, to pray, and I just didn't know how to shut it up so I could talk or to hear what the rest of you had to say, so I'm glad it was over. But anyway, um, I found out the, about the, these Ansari Institute classes through um, the sisters at the at the the uh, Islamic Institute or uh, Islamic uh, Society of Michiana and uh, mm -hmm. the study of religion and the study of uh, uh, race racial uh, relationships and uh, that kind of stuff always. Uh, interested me and uh, currently I'm not uh, uh, currently I'm not working. Great. Well welcome. Thank you for thank you for joining us. So um, I wonder I was making I didn't do kind of deep analytical assertions or analysis. I was making some surface observations about um, the, about the way that, um, the ways that kind of at a, at a surface level, how uh, religion and race seem to intersect in the in the comportment of the Georgia Senate races, and then again in what happened in Washington on January sixth. I'm wondering whether your understanding or experience of religion your understanding of uh, religion, how that shapes your analysis of what was happening. I don't know if any of you were paying attention to what was happening in Georgia, but um, if we could talk about Georgia and then about Washington, like just what struck you, what were some observations that you made and how did religion inform those observations? Ronnie, you had started to say something and I had cut you off before, so I want to invite you back in first. So. Thank you. Well, I was thinking about the debate when um, uh, Mrs. Loeffler, I can't, uh, I can only think of her first name being Karen, but I know that's not true. Kelly, uh, Kelly. Kelly. She had mm -hmm. just a pat answer for everything. And the same kind of statement about Reverend um, Warlock every time. I mean, she didn't answer mm -hmm. any questions. She just said, you know, he was radical, he was this, he was that. And um, I, can't, I can't imagine, well, I'll, I'll reserve that. I think that, um, mm -hmm. you know, to say the things that she said to me, they were all lies. And I think that she could have said, um, you know, some other kinds of things, some other ideas, 
express something other than this pat, you know, Republican kind of answer. Um, and so I'm never sure which religion, you know, mm. thinks that kind of name calling and telling things that are not true, you know, in which religion is that acceptable? Mm. So um, let's see, Stephen, you're here. Um, thoughts? Um, yeah, it's such a good question. Um, maybe I'll start with the, 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 the siege in Washington. Um, so I think your question was, how did I um, see it from my perspective? Um, through religion. So I guess mm -hmm. for me saying what was going on, I was thinking um, as an Episcopalian, uh, so of that Christian tradition, what's going on here, you see, you know, Jesus flags and uh, lots of different um, uh, Christian symbols at that riot. But I, I'm thinking this is completely antithetical to the Christianity that I know and practice um in which the way that uh i understand jesus is that he subverts uh power and politics uh through suffering and death mm -hmm. not taking over uh in a in a large mob um mm -hmm. and trying to change the results of a political system in that way um so definitely there was a lot of interpretive work there going on from my own religious tradition and the way that um, I've been raised. Um, mm -hmm. So that, that was that was definitely affecting the way I, I, I saw all that unfolding. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Hey, Paula, what thoughts do you have about what what you were seeing either in Georgia or in Washington? Well, um... I've been a Christian most of my life. I'm Muslim uh, now, and I couldn't imagine uh, Jesus behaving uh, in such a way or condoning such behavior. Uh, it, uh, in fact, he said at the Last Supper, uh, according to um, the New Testament, uh, love one another as I would as I have loved uh, you and I believe that he loved his apostles and other people around him dearly. And as a Muslim, well, I believe that he, that he was a great pro a prophet and uh, still wouldn't condone that, uh, uh, condone that kind of hatred or uh, violence. And I didn't realize that religion was involved in the uh, uh, Georgia uh, mm -hmm. runoffs and, until I found out that both of the senators were the uh, Democratic senators were or uh, senator candidates rather were uh, Jewish and um, uh, it wouldn't matter to me if they're Jewish or uh, uh, not but then uh, there are a lot of people that are there are people that are anti-Semitic in this country so it may uh, matter to um, uh, to some people, whether they're Jewish or whether they're something else. Right. So, so one of the two candidate, one of the, one of the two races had a Jewish candidate, but that's right. Um, so Charlie, first thoughts. Yeah, I really appreciate David, just how you framed these questions and topics. It actually, as you were sharing, I was reminded of a book that was written, some scholars um, out of Georgetown on who speaks for Islam, um, an older title. And it just, as you were framing the question, the question came to me in this context, who speaks for Christianity? I thought you did a really wonderful job of laying out, yeah, how do you make sense out of you know, a rally where you have people you know, bearing this label and saying, you know, we're praying to God for his blessing and the critiques and just the, the internal, you have this collective, the Christian world and 
then I think you get some of these words, labels that start coming out of this. So in one of the quotes you talked about, you know, biblical, that becomes this all powerful Trump, Trump card um, mm -hmm. that, well, you know, this is biblical. And, you know, Ronnie was just sharing and I appreciated even the, it's like, well, the word radical. Um, mm -hmm. I was in a conversation just last week with a number of friends um, back in Colorado that I was connected with. And I really appreciated just being in a community of people who are willing to take up these hot topics and to try to engage in a civil conversation about them. And hearing a very close friend of mine talk about concern over some of these things that were unfolding, but at the same time, he started talking about you know, concerns about the liberal agenda. The, mm -hmm. That's kind of the framing of this. And I found for myself, one of the things that was really helpful was just inviting someone to begin to unpack the label. So mm -hmm. to move intentionally beyond. So it's like, when you say you're concerned about the liberal agenda, can you help me understand mm -hmm. what does that actually mean for you? So to try to be very intentional about not operating with just the labels in exclusion. And, and so I think, you know, even biblical. So what is it, obviously, and I think you touched on this, David, but you, know, you have this massive collection of stories and mm -hmm. which ones are you going to highlight? Which ones are you going to de-emphasize I mean, th that's what the Bible is. It's a collection mm -hmm. over centuries mm -hmm. of stories. And many Christians like to say, well, there is the overarching story, but what is that story and how does it apply to these themes I find fascinating. And so trying to invite people to unpack those a bit more, to move from just labels to a bit more particulars. Mm hmm when, so when you speak, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, Charlie, when you speak of labels, I and and unpacking them, I I would love to have that kind of conversation with some people that I know, because they used to have a great deal of critical thinking, and now they espouse all these ideologies about the 2020 election, for example, mm -hmm. um, and, and they don't, I mean, to me, they don't make any sense. And I, mm -hmm. I wonder what was, what was the tipping point for them that they left the world of science and education and critical thinking and just kind of fell off the cliff into this abyss of, of believing the lies coming from the White House. I, I don't, I mean, I don't know what happened to those people. I don't know what changed for them. Mm -hmm. so, just a very quick statement, if I could chime in, David, just yeah, yeah, come one on. thing that I find really helpful on that, Ronnie, I off the charts empathize with you. And yet one of the things that I try to practice is kind of looking at things through the other lens and mm -hmm. You know, honestly, I have friends, just as you were articulating that, I think I'm sure that I have friends who would voice what happened to Charlie. Uh, we thought he understood these things and now something like what was Charlie's tipping point? Right. Where did he leave the in crowd? Yeah, he was he was one of us. Charlie was an mm -hmm. insider. He understood the storyline. What happened that caused him to identify with a different crowd of people? And so I just find that like, wow. So they could be having that same set of questions. And it just helps me to engage from a different posture. So what you all are seeing and we're gonna, we'll work more and more with this over the coming weeks. But what you're seeing is how narratives play out. What, what narratives do 
you know, they, they are the way of containing and uh, transmitting our world viewing practices. It's not like a single world view, but it's world viewing. It tends to be a dynamic way of being, but for some, the world viewing starts to become relatively static or rigid in particular ways. And for others, there is world viewing can seem to be more malleable. So the idea even, Charlie, of taking on somebody else's or trying to step into somebody else's narrative to empathetically engage with them, some would see that as heresy. Like the idea that you would even be willing to stand in somebody else's narrative, even for the moment, for the sake of the argument, you know, just assuming arguendo, how does this work, is problematic. And this is the work of narrative. And what often happens is narratives get more rigid in spaces of fear and threat and danger. They get more rigid and more narrow which is what informs a lot of our conflicts. So what, what I want us to keep doing is pushing on the notions, like how do we begin to identify what those narratives are? So I'm gonna invite you all into a thought experiment. Imagine that you were on the, on the mall marching towards the Capitol on January 6th, and you were with a crowd of people that you loved and agreed with. What is it that you would have to, in your mind, know or believe in order to feel comfortable in the middle of that uh, that crowd or that group? What are some of the things? Not It may not be just one thing, but what are some of the things that you would have to know for yourself or believe for yourself, particularly as it relates to either religion or race? You know, what might you have to believe in order to feel comfortable being with that group on the mall? I think of the phrase, these are my people. Mm -hmm. This, I, there would be an identification. I belong here. Mm -hmm. So these are my people, yeah. Well, you could say, these are my people. I've worked with them for years. I've known them for years. Uh, but then for me, it would be a real stretch to say, and it's okay if I break the law by breaking into the Capitol, defacing federal property, injuring people, killing people. Um, I mean, I, I, I know a lot of people who are on that side. And um, I, I think that, that some of the people that were heard shouting different things while they were in the Capitol, you know, you're taking away my rights, you're taking away my country, you made me do this. I, I think you might have to slide over to that side, you know, and hold those beliefs. What does that mean? Like, for instance, a particular belief that you might have to hold, not like the whole thing, but what is one, what is one thing that you have a sense that you would have to believe? This is, this is part of the practice of stepping into somebody else's narrative is to ask yourself, what would I have to believe in order to, what, what are among the things that I might have to believe in order to align with this thing that currently I don't feel aligned with, right? Uh, I think one thing you would have to, or you might believe that the other side, the Democrats are lying about everything. Okay. 
what would I believe about the Democrats in their thinking about religion? Uh, I think uh, a lot of people would consider many of them not Christians because they are not pro-life. Mm. That, that would exclude them from being uh, pro-life. And if you're not pro-life, then obviously, you know, you couldn't be a Christian. Right. I think that might be one, one thing. Okay. Sure. Sure. Stephen, Paula, what do you guys think? Um, oh, Paula, um, I guess if I had to imagine myself being in that space, um, uh, I might imagine that I would feel that there was just a great um, sense of injustice at what's happening in the world around me. And um, the only way to overturn it um, is by taking sort of extreme action um, with people who think like me. And probably, I imagine I would need to feel the sense of rightness within my religion and in this uh, group of people um, that would keep me going all the way up the steps as we're being pushed back. Um, you know, this is the right thing. This is the only way. Um, so, um, but a lot, a lot of fear, I imagine. I'd, I'd have a lot of fear, uh, but this is the only way sort of thing. Paul, what do you think? Um, I certainly uh, can't. Um, I don't condone what uh, Trump has um, is started his uh, his rallies, but then two wrongs don't make a right. I don't uh, condone. Uh, I don't condone uh, killing or beating them up and uh, one uh, supporter of Trump uh, got uh, peed on and I can't remember what else uh, happened if he uh, had rocks thrown at him or uh, what I don't want. To, uh, so what would you have to believe in order to feel aligned with the people? And I actually, I'm trying to imagine this before they storm the Capitol, before we get to the parts that seem like you know, um, violent, lawless, all of that. Like while they're just rallying together, what would you have to have believed that would cause you to drive from South Bend to leave Northern Illinois and go to Washington to be with, not, not with the intention of, you know, full insurrection, but just to be there on the mall with this group of people experiencing these as my people saying these are my people what would you have to believe i'm a i would be very uh i would be very angry with uh, with uh, trump for uh trying to steal uh, the 2021 2025 term away from uh biden who was the one that was chosen mm -hmm. to be our president for the next uh, term and uh i it just seems like he's it just seems like he's cheating and there are people helping him and uh, mm -hmm. uh and uh i uh, i think that i mean i don't mean to be putting my politics in to it but i think that the uh, biden would be the one that would um be the better one to serve um people like myself and like the uh, people that are uh, over there uh, opposing uh, him. And I, uh, regardless of whether I'm right or wrong, I would like to see uh, uh, Trump give uh, Biden a chance and not steal the, uh, uh, steal the seat by trying to hang on to it for another four years. Sure, sure. So... <clears throat> Before the, let me, let me share this with you. Before the, the violence, the acts of insurrection, before that, 
when there were people gathered on the mall, rallying, listening to um, speeches, many of which were inspired by uh, positions of faith and religious commitments. I was watching and I was trying to distinguish between what was happening there with, and, and their religion was informing their politics. And I was trying to distinguish between what was happening there, what happened at the March on Washington and what happened at the Million Man March. All of which gathered people with deep faith commitments who had particular political positions. And before the insurrection, the mall was a group of folks who said, these are my people and this is what I believe. This is where the country is currently failing me. Am I off base to draw any um, any parallels between those three gatherings? Uh, I don't think so. It may not be an accident. It may not be any coincidence that they all happened at once. Mm. You know, I, I think um, most people want to feel they belong somewhere. They want to feel they belong to a group whether it's a group of a handful of people that you work with, that do the same thing you do, that you go to church with, you know, if you're stepping a little outside of your comfort zone, then you'd be interested to, and it could initially be, I've never been to a rally, I'm gonna go along for the ride and see what happens. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and then they get swept into the domestic terrorism. Right, right. I mean, I mean that's that's a really uh, good question. I mean, I guess for me, part of the question you have to ask is, um, in these different situations, uh, groups are marching because of what they believe to be a great injustice that's happening. And um, right. in order to have that perception, you need information. And so you know you would you would argue that like the march on Washington, the information that those folks have is based on experience, mm -hmm. uh, is based on you know friends and family who have said this. These sorts of things are happening and must be changed. And in the mm -hmm. case of you know the riot happening uh, last week, the information is been propagated on the internet or has been coming out of the mouth of uh, one person. Um, and spread. And so I, I think that the information there is, uh, I guess I wouldn't feel like it's as experiential or based in, in reality as maybe some of those other marches. But. So this is one of those things, Charlie, I'm getting you in because I know you've got, you've got something, but this is how narratives work, is narratives shape what we would say is our epistemology like both where, how we know things and what are the valid sources of knowledge, right? And so narratives tell us where we can get information and then shape how we make meaning of it. And narratives around religion are particularly powerful in doing that. And narratives that are informed by experiences of race are also particularly powerful in doing that and then they intersect in some really interesting ways that also are about doing that and so even if even as we imagine that the sources of information and the meaning making that others are doing seems um, counter to what we believe to be valid sources of knowledge what we believe to be valid interpretive strategies, what we're noticing is that they are enveloped in and operating through a particular set of narratives. And so their epistemology 
is very different from ours, right? Um, grievances create a different epistemology. Um, and so that's one of the things that we'll play with over time is how narratives shape our epistemology, our sense of history, our sense of the future, our practices, our world viewing practices. Charlie, March on Washington, Million Man March, uh, Stop the Steal. How, how do you put those three in conversation with each other? No, I appreciate what Stephen was bringing. I think, and I think it, what you've just articulated is really powerful of this idea that you, it's, these are my people. Be, and I think the idea of identification, group identification comes from shared narrative. Mm -hmm. So it's, mm -hmm. I, I, be, I belong to these people because we share a story in common. And so then what you were just expressing is, yeah, how that begins the connect points that because we share this, we, we see things from a common perspective, shared sense of, I love Stephen, just your expression of a feeling of injustice and that flows out of, yeah, the story that we're hearing and so where we place ourselves within a story. And yeah, mm -hmm. I find this very powerful of, I loved your comment, David, of, yeah. The need to identify that there are different stories at work. And yet mm -hmm. the danger of that is that you articulated a bit earlier, even trying to empathize with another story can, get you kicked out of the group in a hurry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I think these different events, I think that's fascinating for you to look at them and to go, what were the shared narratives, the group identification mm -hmm. that brings, I mean, cause these are clearly large group events. And so what, right. what is that? What's the draw? Mm -hmm. And I think it's, mm -hmm. I really appreciate what you're bringing there of, Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, there's a storyline, there is a narrative, and it's, it's shared in common. And to me, that's always the challenge dealing with crossing cultures, crossing groups, mm -hmm. crossing narratives, like, oh my gosh, that there could be another storyline that's not what I initially identify with, but how powerful if I can begin to at least try. And I think the phrase you used earlier of like, let's try a thought experiment. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I just appreciate that of what, yeah, what kind of effect can that have on us? Um, and how difficult it can be. Mm -hmm. Like uh, several of us here on this panel, like, David, how can you even ask me to imagine being like, I, I would have never been there. Mm -hmm. and it's like, well, what if it was another group that you more naturally do identify with. Well, oh, I could have seen myself with them, but not with this group. But I appreciate that you pulling those together to go, well, is there not a certain similar dynamic at work that, yeah, I, I could have been a part of that one, but not this one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so David, one, of the, one of the, Ronnie, go ahead. If I may ask, how do you compare these three events that you just mentioned with, for example, what happened in Minneapolis when the policeman kneeled on the man's neck until he died when he said, I can't breathe, an actual event, or in Kenosha, Wisconsin, where a policeman mm -hmm. is holding Jacob Blake by the back of his shirt and shoots him seven times in the back. That was a real event. So, I can see how those people would be very angry. They have a real tangible thing to be complaining mm. about. Well, I suppose um, to these other people, maybe those are real. Right. In, in, in law, we often, you often notice that it's difficult to disprove the absence of something. Like it, so, 
if something isn't present, it's hard to prove its absence, right? So if I can't find the, um, the, um, the missing or stolen votes or whatever, then you know, it's hard to disprove that they don't exist. So we build, but it fits inside of the narrative. So, but one of the things, I, one of the questions that's in the uh, Q&A that I do want us to kind of take on, because it's going to lean towards what we do next week, is the question of whether uh, what was happening, whether, whether those who are adherents to this particular narrative that's kind of been given the label of Trumpism, I think that it's a much richer and broader narrative than that, but that's been given the label of Trumpism. Are they a cult? Are they a cult, not occult, but a cult? Is, is this just, does it qualify as a cult? And I don't know. What I, what I actually want us to point to, I'm you know, glad to invite your reflections on that, but I also wanted us to ask for next week, what makes something a religion? Like this is, this is a, a question, how does something get distinguished as a religion as opposed to any other belief system, you know, ideology, is it, what, what makes something a religion? And that would help to respond to this question of is something a cult? Um, and is it possible that cults actually become religions, right? Like some things that start as cults actually become religions, what makes something a religion, what makes something a cult, right? Um, so I'm gonna actually ask you all to uh, write something about that um, for next week. Um, what would draw some, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Thoughts, just really quick on what distinct, no, I don't want to do that. I wanted to really spend time. We're going to lean into that. That's our next week work is to lean into what is a cult, what makes something a religion and how narratives are involved in that. So I'll spend a little bit of time talking next week about kind of this framing of narrative and distinguishing narrative from story. That's a really important distinguish for us to have these conversations. But um, yeah, so last thoughts from the four conversation partners today, just for where we are, knowing that we're gonna pick it up again next week. But any last thoughts from any of the four of you? Paula, Steven, Ronnie, Charlie, anybody? Well, I would consider a religion to have, be a set of beliefs that has something to do with uh, the uh, the existence of God or the uh, non-existence. Well, if you include the non-existence, that would include atheism. But uh, of course, the one thing that the um, um, that the these other religions I could uh, name, like uh, Islam, Judaism, Christianity. Uh, Zoroastrianism, uh, there's some concept of uh, God there as well as uh, uh, how he created this earth, what, uh, how he would want us to live our lives and uh, et cetera. So we're gonna take that up, that's perfect. We're gonna take that up next week. Uh, I wonder about, and, and I look forward to hearing more from each of you on that. I wonder, um, last thoughts on just this idea of how just quick thoughts on race, religion, and the way that they informed what was happening. And we didn't talk quite as much about race in this conversation, even though the articulation of religion, particularly in Washington, very much had a uh, the integration, it seems, the integration of kind of a white supremacist logic as part of it. 
and we'll probably come back to that a bit next week. But last thoughts, questions, just not even questions, just last thoughts for us to leave on as we're wrapping up for the, for the evening. I think it's just helpful, the idea, the categories of legitimate, illegitimate. Um, mm -hmm. You throw out, you know, the idea of heresy, it's, you know, what's orthodox, what's heretical, I think are really at the core of these topics. Mm -hmm. I know that there is a lot of racism in many churches, in many religions. And they may not even be aware that they would be considered racist. Mm -hmm. They must have forgotten Genesis 127, so. Mm -hmm. Stephen, last thought. I mean, yeah, as you said, it's, it was, race was clearly at the heart of all these conversations. Um, and um, I don't know if I have anything <laughs> necessarily good or important to add to it. So I, I'll just leave it there. Okay. So um, thank the four of you, um, Paula, Ronnie, Steve, and Charlie for being willing to step in, not knowing that this is how uh, the course would be organized, but taking the courageous step of jumping in and being conversation partners. And I look forward in the next several weeks to doing exactly the same thing. It's teeing up an idea, beginning with some pieces, and then let's just play and explore and have some thought conversation together. And so I hope people are interested and willing to lean into that practice with me. We'll do some thought experiments. We'll develop some language that we can use around narratives and meta narratives and where hegemony and ideology fit into all of this and how all of that uh, shapes our understanding and our relationship to these constructs of race and religion. And so I look forward to that for the next uh, several weeks together. Um, I don't know, Mahan, if we have an official signing off practice that we do, but I want to invite you back to do whatever that is. We, we, we do not. This was, um, this was just uh, so very interesting. Um, and thank you. Uh, I can just tell it's going to be a fantastic uh, seven weeks. I look forward to seeing uh, how the questions next week are, are engaged. Uh, thank you all for coming. And please tell your friends um, people in, uh, in your um, networks who you think would like uh, to participate in a conversation like this, uh, we welcome everybody. All and right. people outside of your networks, people who you don't really think, people that you aren't currently interested in having conversation with, but we might be able to create some spaces for some of those conversations, invite those folks as well.